morning, church. How are you? Good. You guys happy to be here? I'm happy to be here. Thank you to all of you who are here. I know that's something that just some of us do on Sabbath. Uh, welcome to all those that are visiting. Uh, welcome to those that are online listening. Hi, family. Love you. Um, I want to say thank you to my girls. So I am not techie. Anybody who knows me, I'm not techie. So my slideshow was done by Genevieve and Jason, my two girls. So I'm very proud of them. So thank you. Um, also, I have some little helpers. So some of you actually got a sheet of paper when you were walking in. Um, I made them for all of the kids, but I think all of them are out having fun and skiing so since it's a three-day weekend. Um, girls, at this point in time, if you want to pass out more papers and pencils. So what I have today is um, I'm going to be preaching on sewing and growing. So there, I'm sure there's Bible verses or passages to all of you that really mean something. So the passage I'm going to preach on today is something that I learned as a child, um, reread as an adult. It actually changed me so much that I got baptized as an adult about three and a half years ago. And I've even come back to read it over and over. And um, it continues to change me. It continues to grow me. So the kids will be passing out these little pieces of paper um, because I'm going to be preaching on the sower and the seed. So I was hoping there'd be more kids here. So it looks like adults, you get to sing with me. I know you weren't thinking you're going to sing with me, but you are. So I'm going to have you guys repeat after me. Do you guys remember the song, The Sower, as a little kid? It was one of the songs that I thought was so fun as a little kid. You guys ready to sing? Okay, repeat after me. Here we go. The sower, the sower. went out to sow. To sow, to sow some seeds in hopes that they would grow. They would grow. Some seeds fell on the path. Go, go! <laughs> some seeds fell on the rock. Some seeds fell in the weeds. Some seeds fell on the good soil. Whooping. <laughs> the sower went out to sow some seeds to see if they would grow. <laughs> to sow some seeds to see if they would grow. Yay! <laughs> I'm so proud of you guys. I'm sure there's animals howling or broken glass from my voice, but you guys were amazing. So again, we are going to talk about the sower and the seed, okay? So anybody, adults, you may have a piece of paper as well. So the point of the paper is we're going to be going through the soil, right? Because that's primarily what Jesus was talking about, was the types of soil. So kids, you can draw pictures. There's the four different types of soil. Kids, you draw pictures. Adults, obviously there's some deeper meaning that we're going to be talking about, okay? So you guys can jot down some notes. But before we get started, I'd like to pray. Okay, so everyone close their eyes. Dear Lord, good morning. Thank you so much that we can be here today. And Lord, that we can dive into this parable that you have given us. Um, Lord, it is important. Lord, you made it very clear that this is a very important parable. Um, so God, I pray that you soften our hearts. I pray that you open our ears. Let us hear what you want to tell us. Lord, you are not the God of condemnation, but you do convict us. So, Lord, I pray that we are convicted and we can learn and we can grow and we can spread your gospel to those, everyone who needs to hear it. Amen. Okay, so those who have their Bibles, uh, we are going to open up to Matthew 13. Um, this parable is actually told in three of the gospels. Okay, so we're going to study the one in Matthew. So, here we go. That day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed some seeds, they fell on the side of the road. And the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, because they had no depth of soil. But with the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, or the weeds, and the thorns came up and choked them out. The others fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, 
some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. So I'm going to stop at that point right there. So do you think that this parable is important? Do you know why I think it's important? Jesus literally says, those that have ears, let him hear. Do we have ears? Should we hear with them? Do you think it's possible to have ears and not hear? So the thing I find really interesting, too, is not only does Jesus say it here, you hear it a little bit throughout the Bible, but one place that you consistently hear this phrase of whoever has ears on here, it actually comes up in Revelation. So in the very beginning of Revelation, where it's the seven letters to the seven cities, I find it really interesting because at the end of every letter, it says, those that have ears, let him hear. Which is interesting because each letter is to a different church or a different city that is going through something, and God says, I hear you, I see you, I love you, but you need to change, okay? There's also something I find interesting, that we know seven is the perfect number. There were seven churches, there's also seven continents, and when you listen to each of these churches, they are us. They are every one of us. There are people who are maybe lukewarm, or who have fallen short, or maybe find idols, or, or all of these different things. So point being, Jesus, I think, really needs us to hear, okay? We are going to skip the next part, and we're going to go down to verse 18, where it's explained. Hear the parable of the sower. So stepping back, literally the disciples, after Jesus preached, the disciples came up to him and said, hey, we don't understand. I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain it? So then it says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. What has been sown in his heart? This is the one whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom the seed was sown on rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one with whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom the seed was sown was on the good soil. And this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. Okay? So today we are going to be talking about the characters in our story. Okay? So we have a couple characters. We have the seed, we have the soil, and we have the sower. Let's start with the seed. Jesus makes it pretty clear what the seed is, right? He explains that the seed is the word of God, okay? It is the kingdom of God. There's actually 13 parables that Jesus preaches on that talks about the kingdom of heaven. The thing that I find so beautiful about this story is I think so many times we think, oh, when we die, we get to go to heaven. But I think we often forget that the kingdom of heaven is here. And that's one thing that this story shows is that these people who have good soil are having 30, 60, 100 fold, they are making their soil or their heart. They are making it welcome to God's word, and they are flourishing here on earth. That does not mean that they don't have problems or trials, but they have taken in God's word, and they are growing in faith. So the kingdom of heaven is here on earth. We also know that the seed, okay, the seed is not the problem. Would you guys agree? When you listen to the story, it's the soil that's the problem, right? I think so many times, sometimes we hear the word of God, and we don't like, is that me that's making the noise? Um, sometimes we think, oh, I don't, I don't like what the Bible has to say about this. So maybe we like our interpretation, or maybe we pick and choose what we like from the Bible. Something, oh no, that, that's just for somebody else. That's not my problem. I don't need to worry about that. So one thing I really want to encourage you is when you're taking in the Bible, make sure that you're taking in all of it, not your interpretation, okay? I know I have done that in the past, that I pick and choose the things, oh yeah, Jesus loves me, I love that part, and then I, I, I get rid of that other stuff, okay? So make sure you are taking in that entire seed, okay? 
Let's go to the soil. Who here thinks they have good soil? I would agree. We, we have some good soil. Who thinks that they're only good soil? Because you're a Christian and you go to church that you only have good soil. I would like to say that every one of us probably has all four types of soil. Okay? I know at one point in time, and maybe that's why I never went back to the story I heard as a kid, and I was like, I know the story. I love Jesus. I got good soil. And I think I just kind of moved away from the story. It wasn't until a couple years ago that I was studying it again that I was like, wow, I got a lot of rocks and weeds and thorns. And I even have some hard parts in my heart. And I realized that that might be kind of hard to think about. Um, the Bible often talks about as we grow closer to Jesus, we ask, you know, God says you need to be refined in the fire. Refining is not a gentle process right? I mean, fire, that is hot, that is painful. Thorns are painful. Weeds are painful. Rocks are painful. So this process, and my goal, and my hope is for you guys as we go through this, is that you're jotting down these things of, this is the hard soil in my heart. This is the the parts that you need to work on. Because again, our entire goal is to get closer to God. So soil is our heart. So let's start with hard soil, okay? Okay. So I know it's hard to believe, but we all have some hard soil, okay? So the hard soil that they talk about is the path, okay? So in my mind, this is the place where people have heavily traveled. This is where the ground is getting compacted from repetitive beating down. Have you guys ever felt like you have been repetitively beaten down? Sometimes you feel like people have trampled on you. Maybe life has trampled on you. Maybe multiple people have trampled on you. Maybe Christians and friends have trampled on you, and your heart has become hard. Sometimes path and hard soil just might mean a part of you, right? Some people have been trampled and hurt so much, they've completely turned their hearts from God. So the second you mention the gospel, there is no way that they're even going to listen, okay? So we know God is the God of healing, and he can heal. So that's what our hope is, right? That any bit of hard soil, God can soften. So when we talk about hard soil, what are some things that could be our hard soil? Okay? Something that just is completely impenetrable to your heart. You guys might have trigger words. I know I have some trigger words. There might be a political term. There might be... Republican or Democrat, or maybe the word COVID, right? There are certain words that are trigger words. I know it might sound crazy, but here in church, sometimes the word tithes and offering, trigger word for people. Sometimes we hear tithes and offering. I'm not giving to church. They all, all they want is my money. That might be something we think. For whatever reason, something has hardened our heart to the idea of giving to the God who has given us everything, right? So, one of the things for me that I did not realize was actually that my heart was hard towards baptism, which I didn't think it was because I was baptized as a baby. But it wasn't until four-ish years ago that I studied this again, and I literally asked God, hey God, what's my hard soil? And he said, baptism which really offended me, right? Sometimes it's hard to hear the truth, but God said baptism. He's like, it doesn't matter that you're baptized as a baby. I want you to grow in faith. So guess what? Growing is not easy, so I need you to realize that this is something I'm calling you to do because I want a better life for you than what you had before, okay? So again, what is your hard soil? There's actually a... um, He's a, he's a Messianic Jew. He's actually a rabbi and a pastor that I listen to. He's, he's really interesting to listen to. His name is Jonathan Kahn, okay? His testimony, he talks about, I'm going to use the term hard-hearted. So he was raised being Jewish, okay? Had faith until he was about eight. About eight, he said he went to temple, and he just did not feel God's presence in his life in temple anywhere, and he's like, this is ridiculous. There's no God. So he said he became an atheist at eight, okay? Which to me is just devastating. Amazing that a child has some sort of spiritual knowledge, but devastating that at eight, he thought there was no God. 
So then he started reading everything. He loved to read books about UFOs and evolution, and he said any scientific type book he could get his hands on, he was excited to read it. Until he was about 16-ish, or maybe 13, he came across a book he said looked like a UFO book. And actually, I forgot the name of it, it was called The Late Great Planet Earth, which is basically a book about end times. And he said he read this book, and he came to find that Jesus was real. And he just thought, wow, Jesus is real. God is real. This is amazing. Yeah, I'm not changing my life. So he literally made a deal with God and was like, hey, God, I know that you're real, but I'm kind of having fun in life. I got a rock band. I kind of like partying. This, this life is really fun for me. So what I'm asking is you give me a really long life, and on my deathbed, I'll commit my life to you. He said, literally, within the next month or two, he almost died twice. God has a funny sense of humor, right? He said, on my deathbed. So he said the second time, he was in his car and was hit by a train, okay? He said his car was demolished and he did not have a scratch on him. So he said, he got out of the car, said, God, we're going to rene renegotiate, okay? He said, I'm going to turn 20 in eight months and I'm going to commit my life to you in eight months. Don't kill me, right? So he said everything he'd ever read was Jewish. He knew, he knew about going to a mountain. That's where Moses went. So he went to the top of a mountain, and he gave his life to God, okay? So we all have hard soil. I pray that we do not have a come-to-Jesus moment like that. I pray that our moment is something like us sitting here in church and saying, God, soften my heart to this hard soil, okay? So homework number one, what's your hard soil? Okay, two, rocky soil, okay? So when we think of rocky soil, we know what rocks are, right? If I walk on rocks, I'm a little unsteady walking on rocks, okay? Rocks can be annoying, right? They can be in our way, especially wearing heels and you twist your ankle. Rocks can be annoying, okay? The big thing about rocky soil, as we talked about, there's these rocks that don't allow the roots to get deep. So it means that somebody has actually accepted the Bible or part of the Bible or Christ, right? Some people will receive Christ with joy and something happens and they lose faith altogether. Some of us might just receive something with joy and something hard happens in life and that part of us dies and we give up on that part. For example, okay, it might be something simple like you wear a Christian sweatshirt. You went to a concert. You wear a Christian sweatshirt. Your friend makes fun of it. So you decide you're never going to wear that Christian sweatshirt and you're never going to talk to Jesus, talk about Jesus to that friend. Okay? Your faith was that deep about, I'm going to tell people about Jesus. Maybe you're a prayer warrior. And maybe there's something heavy on your heart, and you are praying, and you're praying, and you're praying, and you are confident that God will answer your prayer. So you pray, and over time, God doesn't answer this prayer. So that part of you dies, and you decide, I'm not going to be a prayer warrior, because prayer doesn't work. Or maybe you lose your faith altogether, because God did not answer that prayer. So that rocky soil has hurt your relationship with Jesus. Maybe this is something you post on social media. Maybe you're so excited about a Bible verse or a parable or there's something that God answers your prayer and you put it on social media, nobody likes it, and that's it. You're just done. You're not going to put anything on social media. Nobody actually hurt your feelings, but nobody filled you up and gave you joy. It's that super, superficial joy that we look for sometimes, okay? So again, what are those rocks that you might have? I know there was a time where, um, I'm going to throw myself under the bus. So I think all of us who are here, we are here because I'm guessing we love God. And we are so grateful to him for his love and his mercy and the peace that he can give us and his forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me, right? Because I am messed up, right? So I just remember going to church, and uh, I was so excited to go to church. The praise and worship was amazing. I'm like, Jesus loves me. He forgives me. Oh, this is the best. I'm so happy. I'm so happy, right? Praise and worship leads me closer to Jesus. Pastor Rico was preaching, and he, he was doing a great job. And I remember it was uh, communion Sabbath. 
So he was talking about coming to the altar and coming to the feet of Jesus and preparing your heart to meet Jesus. And I was like, yeah, I'm there. I love Jesus. I'm excited. We're going to have communion. And then he said, and he, rep- he uh, mentioned the Bible verse, but he basically said, if any one of you has something against your brother or sister, set down your sacrifice, make it right with them, and then you can be with me and serve me. And I thought, I'm not mad at my brother or sister. I'm mad at my man who's sitting right next to me who made me mad before church. Right? So that little diva attitude seems funny, but that little ego, that little attitude was keeping me from communing with God. And there was literally a small part of me that was like, dang, there are all of these hard places and rocks in our soil, in our soul, that we need to make sure that we take care of. So write it down. What is your rocky soil? Next one is weeds. Depending on which uh, Bible translation, it'll also say thorns, okay? So weeds are annoying. Anybody who gardens a garden, weeds are obnoxious, right? The problem with weeds and the problem with thorns what they do is they come in and they take all the nutrients from whatever I'm trying to grow. It's their life sucking, right? They drain the nutrients. If they get big enough, they will actually take the sunlight away. They'll cover it from the sun. They will take its water. And it is a slow death of my plant, okay? Thorns are also painful and prickly. You guys know where I'm going with this? What are the weeds and the thorns that you guys have, that I have? Okay? For example, this one's painful. When I was going through, like, what is my hard soil? What is my rocky soil? For some reason, I felt like weeds was the most, like, that one got to me. That was one of those ones that I think is really hard because even when you guys are gardening, if you rip off the top of the weed... But if the root stays, it will grow again. So there are things that I feel I've been really good about, like ripping that weed out, but they just keep coming back. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Do you guys have those problems, those distractions, those things that are sucking you away from God in a relationship with God? Maybe something that is sucking you away from relationships that are good Christian relationships? Music. I don't know about you guys. Music has been one of those things that it's everywhere. We love our family. We love watching dancing shows. Okay? I love watching people dance, dance competitions. But you can't get away from secular music. And I don't know how many of you actually, I kind of stopped just listening to it all together. If you really listen to the words of these songs, which is why I bring up music, For example, I don't watch the Grammys. I don't know if any of you watch the Grammys. There are certain performances and certain songs that are honored and given awards for. And when you're listening to these songs, like one of them was called Unholy. You'd think just the name of it, Unholy, would be enough to not listen to. Okay? But when you listen to it, not only is it gross, the entire song is about what people do in an affair. So what are these things that we're putting into our brains that are now catchy and popular and out there that is slowly corrupting our moral code, right? So music is one of those distractions. So not only music isn't necessarily bad, but is it what music? And is this music drawing you closer to God? Or is it corrupting your moral code and making you think that it's okay? Okay? Other weeds. Social media. There's nothing essentially wrong with social media, but is it drawing you closer to Jesus? Or is it corrupting your moral code and bringing you further and further away? Okay? I love Pinterest. I'm not going to lie. I love Pinterest. But guess what? When it is taking me away from my family, let's say especially on Sabbath, right? I just want to relax. But all if it's doing is pulling me away. And maybe 
Maybe it's work. Maybe you work so hard that you're just tired and you just don't have the energy to either pray or go to church or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's even more sneaky. Sometimes it's actually your blessing. Does that make sense? Sometimes it's a blessing that is actually keeping you from God. For example, you might be praying, God, not me, I'm married. God, I want a boyfriend. Lord, I need a boyfriend. I am so tired of being alone. And you finally get this boyfriend. But guess what? That boyfriend doesn't want to go to church. And he wants to take you out, let's say, every Friday night for dinner. Which doesn't on the outside seem bad, other than now maybe you're not having your usual quiet time or your Sabbath time with your family. Maybe it's your blessing of, God, I hate my job. Lord, I need a new job. This job is so unfulfilling. So guess what? You get a promotion. You have a new job. But now you're working extra hours. Now you're not home for family dinner. Now you're leaving earlier. And now you are just too tired to do your morning worship and your morning devotion. Maybe it's, God, I want a new house. Oh, Lord, I just want a new house. We're living on top of each other. Now you have this bigger house. Now your kids have their own room, and all they want to do is stay in the room so you don't get to see your kids. You don't get to have that family meal where you pray and you talk about the day and you help them through all those really horrible things that are going on in life and give them the spiritual guidance that they need. Maybe you have to now work more hours to pay for that house payment. Okay, so there's so many little weeds that I feel can get inside of us. So again, I think this is one of the hardest ones, right? I just, I also think um, it's kind of interesting because when you, when you hear Jesus, right? Jesus told the parable, but he didn't really explain it. He explained it later to the disciples, Okay, so all of this is painful, right? Having to look at yourself and say, man, what are my hard, my hard soil? What's my rocky soil? What are the weeds? And we're all Christians, and we all want to grow closer to God. Imagine Jesus, who's t- talking to thousands of people from all different cultures, ethnicities, religions. They all have a different religious background. Can you imagine how volatile it would have been if Jesus was actually saying what I'm saying to all of these people, they already killed him after three years. They would have knocked him off even sooner if he was standing up and saying these kinds of things. So again, this I feel is so profound and just such, and he even said to them, you know, if you can't understand this parable, then how are you going to understand the others? So I feel like this is really just one of his most basic stepping stones of how to have the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so again, Write it down. What is your weeds? What are your thorns? Next one is good soil, right? This is the good soil. This is what every one of us wants. It's not as easy as just going to the store and buying good soil, right? Good soil takes time. It takes hard work, right? This is somebody who every single day is wandering through the, the garden of their heart, right? And they're picking out weeds and thorns and rocks and they're, they're chopping up that hard soil, okay? Think about hard soil, or excuse me, uh, good soil. Um, good soil takes time, right? So those that do some amount of gardening, if you were to take like a bell pepper seed, you don't just wake up the next morning and have bell peppers, okay? I think a lot of times we pray something and we expect God to answer us with a prayer the next morning. Sometimes he does. The bell pepper pops up really fast. But most of the time, it doesn't work that way, right? Bell peppers can take months from a seed to fruit on a plant. It can take even eight months. Citrus and avocados take years from a seed to harvesting fruit. It can take 13 to 18 years to harvest fruit, okay? It can take a long time. Okay, so as far as good soil, it takes time. That means your daily devotions. That's putting God first in all things, which is really, really hard. The other thing is, um, on average, 
seven times is a good yield. Right? So if you hear that seven times is a good yield, but what did Jesus say? How many, how many times will, will it be blessed and multiplied? He said 30, 60, and 100. Okay? So man, it might seem like so much work to put into having a relationship with Jesus, but it will absolutely, God it will never let you down right? He will never, never, never let you down. So as much as I keep talking about what are the thorns, what are the weeds, what are the rocks, what are the hard spots, what is your good soil? Thank you, God, that you have blessed us, right? So look into your heart. What are those things that you're like, wow, Lord, you really have helped me grow in my patience. You really have helped me grow in wisdom. And when I say wisdom, thank you for letting me bite my tongue when I should bite my tongue right? If we are wanting to grow a Jesus tree in our heart that is full of fruit of the Spirit, we need to have good soil, okay? So again, I want you to think about what is your good soil. Let's move on to the sower, okay? So I think this is the part that for me was really interesting. You know, growing up, we always learned about the four types of soil, and that was really what kind of changed my heart and made me want to grow closer to God. But once I feel like I'm, I'm on that path and I'm, I'm still working hard. And then I started realizing, well, the sower in the story, being another one of those characters, I think a lot of times we just assume the sower is maybe God or maybe we assume the sower is a preacher or Christian music, somebody who's spreading seed, okay, which is true. But I want us to realize that we are also a sower, okay? So it's interesting. The, back in the day when they were listening to this story, Everyone back there had some amount of farming knowledge, right? So everyone knew if you're going to, you know, sow seeds, so, you know, walk around, throw seeds. Everybody knew that if you would throw seeds on hard path, rocky soil, and weeds, that's a waste of your time. Not only is that a waste of your time, but that's a waste of your money, okay? Because they know it's only going to grow in good soil. So I just think about the people listening who, again, maybe had those hard hearts and did not understand they're thinking, this sower is terrible, right? They're thinking he's wasting his time, wasting his money, throwing it on rocky soil. But what I love about God, he doesn't view my hard soil, my rocks, my thorns, he doesn't view that as a waste of his time. Same with us. We should not view others who maybe seem hearted, seem hard-hearted. You know, God doesn't ask us to pick and choose who we sow seeds to. God wants us to literally scatter seeds everywhere. When I was looking up just to, you know, I did such a good job singing, right? I had to look it up and make sure I knew what I was singing. Um, There's another version of a soil and a seed that they did, and they did this little lyric that was, hey, seed sower, be a better thrower. And I thought that was just really clever in the way of, you know, in this song, I didn't like it because it was making fun of the sower, that he wasn't doing a good job. But again, that is God's goodness. God wanted to preach to Jews and Gen- or Jesus wanted to preach to Jews and Gentiles. He wants everyone in his kingdom. And this being a kingdom story, he is saying, sow your seeds to everybody. So we know that sowing seeds is like this, okay? Have you ever sowed seeds like this? Or even like that? Think about that. I have. I'm not proud of it. But I have. I have absolutely. Um, are you going to go to church today? I've never said the next time, like, Jesus isn't going with you to the bar, right? But, but those are these kind of things that we think we're being helpful, right? We think that, oh, I'm, I'm telling somebody what's true. You, you can't be living that lifestyle and think it's okay. But again, we are throwing seeds at people. We are jamming it down their throat. And that is never what Jesus asks for. Um, JC, my fifth grader, she came home the other day. It's amazing how you can still, you know, are you smarter than a fifth grader? I guess I'm not. Um, Her teacher, she has some cute little saying that I just found really smart. And uh, basically, JC came home and she's like, how was school? Oh, it was good. We did math. It's getting harder. And, And the kids in class were really mad. They said, oh, math is so stupid. I hate math. We don't need math. Um, There's no reason for math at all. 
And the teacher looked at the kids and was like, okay, you're not allowed to say anything unless it's nice, necessary, and true. Right? Write that down. Nice, necessary, and true. So how many times have I, have we, sown seeds? Well, it's true. Why can't I say it's true? They shouldn't be doing that. Maybe it's necessary. Did Jesus tell people they were wrong at every opportunity? There are plenty of times that Jesus just bit his tongue and realized, this is not the time for me to speak on that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on this, and in time I will speak on that. Right? So along with this, we need to have that spiritual maturity. I'm sure you've had people throw, throw seeds at you too. I know I have. There was actually a point in time where somebody said to me, oh, you do so much with the church. You know, I see you talking all the time, but, um, but I've never seen you get baptized. And it was one of those things I felt like I was getting, getting thrown at. But I took a breath and I stepped away and I realized it was true. It maybe wasn't nicely said. And maybe it could have come from a different person or, or, you know, like maybe I could have taken it better from a different person who was maybe closer to me. Maybe I wouldn't have. Maybe I would have been ruder to them, <laughs> right? My, my point is, is I pray that we also have this spiritual maturity, right? That when somebody is speaking truth to you, really be careful how you receive it. Don't just say no to the seed. Don't be hard-hearted, right? Just because you don't like the way it was sown, okay? So again, whether it's coming to you or whether it's to somebody else, make sure that it's nice, that it's necessary, and that it's true. One thing... Um, you know, I'm just thinking about scattering seeds, right? What's a, what's a gentle way of scattering seeds? Uh, there's a place that I go to to get my car smogged. Um, I will never go anywhere else. Just the gentleman is the sweetest man. And um, it's, you drop your car off, it's just one man show. It's just John, and uh, I leave my car, and he's got this little picnic bench, and he's got all these little, you know, surf, it's in San Clemente, all these little surf magazines and all this different, and he's got a Bible, and then he always has some form of a devotional. And so I just, I think it's just so beautiful how he just sets the seeds out there, right? So I went up to him uh, just this past week and I said, hey, I, you know, I just think it's really beautiful that you put that Bible out there. And I put the devotion, I read that devotion this morning, thank you, you know. And he said, wow, that, you know, thank you so much, right? Because we all need encouragement as Christians. We all need to know that we're not alone. And he said, thank you so much for saying that. And he goes, that's just my little way. He said, that's just how I like to minister. He goes, you would not believe how many people pick up one of those books, like either the devotional or that Bible, and just start bawling. He goes, I pray with people all the time, and they come to know Jesus. I just think, what a beautiful little ministry, right? He's not pushy. He is just leaving it there. And then he waits for that moment. He lets the Holy Spirit do its job, right? He creates an environment, lets the Holy Spirit do its thing, and then he comes in and prays with them. And I just think if there were more of us that were brave enough or gentle enough, think of how different this world would be. Think of how much more joy and how much more peace, right? And how much more love there would be if we all sowed seeds in such a more loving and gentle way. Okay, so now we know how to sow seeds, right? But now I want to know what seeds are we sowing? I have to check myself on this all the time, right? I'd like to think that I'm always talking about the gospel. I'm always sowing love and joy and mercy and peace. I'm praying that I'm always sowing that, but I'm not. Sometimes I might sow seeds of irritability. What do you think I'm going to grow? A lot of annoyed people around me, right? Maybe I'm sowing seeds of anger. What if we sow seeds of lies? If we sow seeds of lies, even if it's just a little one, right? Just a little lie. What is, I, we've all seen what happens when we sow things that are not what God wants. One thing I thought was really interesting, uh, 
weeds, for example. There's a certain weed, I just forgot the name of it. It's that weed, its seed can sit in soil for 80 years and not die. Okay? 80 years. So on one end, there's the weed part of it continuing to fester and come back. But I think that what's so amazing is when we speak a word of life into someone, right? I think it lasts more than 80 years. There might be somebody who you don't think that you're making any progress with. There might be someone in your life who is broken and hurt and on the wrong path, and you just keep speaking love. That's all you can do. I, I can't do it. I'm praying for him. I'm loving on him. That's all I can do. And it feels like it's not working. Well, guess what? I guarantee that seed or those many seeds that you are sowing in them, someday it's going to grow into something. So do not grow weary of sowing seeds of love and of Jesus. Okay? Made me think of a Bible verse. Verse in Galatians. Galatians 6, okay? So it starts out sounding heavy. I always like the, I always like the second part of the verse. So we'll read the first part, but it's interesting that they come together. So Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows his own flesh will be from the flesh will reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit, well, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. This is what I like. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. So, again, we reap what we sow. Right? So again, let's make sure that we are sowing the seeds that God wants us to, his gospel and its full truth, okay? But even more, do not grow weary of doing good. I hang on to this promise. <laughs> you guys ever get tired? Yes, right? So it's hard. It is hard to be loving and merciful and kind, right? It's easy when people are nice, but it's not easy in a world that is angry and hurting and broken, okay? So I want you to cling on to this promise, right? Do not grow weary of doing good. For in due time, you will reap what you have sown, okay? So in closing, what are you growing and what are you sowing, right? I know this is painful. I know this is hard. Again, if each one of us truly want to grow closer to God, it's something we got to work on. Okay? And as you're working on it, do not grow weary of doing good. Have a happy Sabbath.